Okay, me 40 here, Manly in North Sydney. Uh, just thinking about my mother. So on my first birthday, she got very sick and she was diagnosed with bone cancer. And over the next three years, she just withered away to about uh, 50 pounds. She was about five foot two, withered away to about 50, 50, 60 pounds. And was just in excruciating pain. <clears throat> and the doctors and the hospices and the hospitals where she was staying, they, uh, they severely limited the amount of uh, morphine they would give her because they didn't want her to get addicted. I mean, and this used to be the norm up until about the 1990s. Right, so people who are dying in excruciating pain, they get very limited amounts of painkillers in case they get addicted. But these are people who are dying, right? And and you're limiting the the amount of uh, painkiller they get when they're dying, right? So we went from that from that extreme, the people who are dying in excruciating pain, like my mother, you know, limited in the amount of morphine they get, to the 1990s opioid scandal, where doctors you know, are strongly incentivized to dish out opiates. So how about a middle road here? How about the middle path? Speaking of the middle path, here's some Richard Spencer. And it's these people who are gonna kind of re-enter the world, I think, in the coming years, in a very big way. Talking about incels, people who are losing in the current system, that they're gonna want to revolutionize a system in which they are losing. And this is from Richard's December 7 good times on his Substack podcast. I mean, what do you think is behind this, this extreme sort of uh, revolt against civilization? I, like, whatever I think about, um, you know, the, the, like, for example, sort of being discontent with um, what they sort of push uh, on television. You know, I was just reading something um, here uh, recently from one of these really traditional Catholics, uh, this Dr. Taylor Marshall, or I don't know if you're familiar with it, but um, uh, he's, he's, he's the head honcho of, of the, of the tranny cap movement. And, uh, and he said, why, why are there always interracial couples in commercials? You know, just an observation. And he got a ton of heat from, from it. Uh, you know, it's like, well, what's wrong with that? You know, there's no other Greek nor Jew, you know, uh, which are actually valid criticism given, given his position. But at any rate, um, So it illustrates how incredibly flexible Christianity is. It isn't inherently globalist and non-racist, right? Just as often there's a strong, a racial and, and ethnic component to it. So people think that they can you know, find an essence of, of Judaism or an essence of Christianity in you know, just one particular text or one particular denomination or one particular expression at a particular point in time. But you know, everything is affected by its context, by the time in which it operates. Right? We're not just you know, individuals, and we're not just you know, spiritual beings. We also operate in time and space. And when the time and space leans in a particular direction, right, you can't fight reality. You, you either adapt to reality or you die. I, I even get this talking with family members of mine, and it's like, you know, have you ever considered turning off the television and cracking the book open? Like, you don't have to, you know, it's like, why don't we have... Look, the type of person who watches TV and is not interested in cracking open a book, right, they have lower intelligence than the type of people who like to crack open books. Or they have an incredibly demanding job, and so they just need to chill out. Or sometimes, yeah, people just get into a bad habit or a bad pattern and they just start slacking off and taking the easy way out in life. But uh, very rarely we get anywhere with family or friends by directly appealing to them to turn off TV and open a book. You have to seduce people to your way of thinking. Now, you can't just command people. Alternatives, it's like, well, you do. I mean, you can, yeah. Yeah. you can do, in fact, you know. Um, but it always goes straight to like, well, we need to homeschool our kids and start, you know, uh, going to Latin Mass. It's like, well, I don't, you know, there's, you, or you could just decide to quit watching the NFL if it offends you so much. I mean, that's, that's another thing. You could, I, there's just, it just seems like a, uh, it's like, it's, it, so I noticed a lot of people on the distant ride just want to go to war with sports, 
and sports is a way to connect right you get in a cab right you can talk about sports with you know your cab driver with all sorts of men that you meet in particular it's an easy way to connect and with many women like if you're interested in being successful and affecting people you wouldn't be just cutting yourself off from a very popular pastime that brings tremendous amounts of happiness and meaning to people's lives such as sports desire to do something extreme and they're just they're just waiting for some well i look i agree with i agree with you but you know maybe this is me becoming more laid back as i get older and also when i have when i have kids as well like i i totally needless to say i totally agree with you like you don't have to go obsess about balenciaga all day you can actually go read a history of european culture and you know you're not going to find many interracial couples in that book you know like good news so i totally agree with that but i also like i, I really don't like the anti-social element i, I think that good point you can get it, it's kind of a trap or like like for instance maybe you should just go watch your favorite nfl team yes on a sunday afternoon you know and like that actually means you have something in common with your neighbors and people around you. I, I, have, I, I think I've said this before. Whenever, I mean, there's not many taxi cabs around any day, but like whenever you're in an Uber, and I remember taxi cabs, you know, 10 or 15 years ago, you, you would often be in a cab with like a Muslim or some black guy or whatever. And the one thing, you know, like, like let's say you're in an hour long taxi cab cab going from Logan Airport to, you know, outer Massachusetts or, you know, whatever. The one thing you have in common with that guy is that you could talk about football. Do you think there's actually something to be said for that? You know? No, I, like, I totally agree. I just mean if, if it's know, all gonna, this kind of anti-social, so like, I agree. I agree with that, obviously. But like this, this kind of anti-social turn of these people, I, I just find pretty like annoying. You know. And Richard was like this. He used to kind of castigate watching sports. It was like cuck ball, and and alt right would counter program against the Super Bowl with alt right content. Like, I, I don't know. Like. It's, there's worse things in the world. Wait, I was like this too when I first became religious. But uh, I kind of turned my book, uh, turned my back on sports from pretty much from largely from 1989 to 1992 when the Dallas Cowboys started getting really good. But luckily my, my hero, my inspiration for becoming religious and turning to Judaism was Dennis Prager, who's a very moderate person. Dennis would say, you know, yeah, watch some sports, uh, you know, do it moderately, don't don't devote the whole weekend to it. World than watching uh, Tom Brady. <laughs> and the fact that, like, that's probably a very, very normal thing for a 14-year-old boy to be interested in. And it's very abnormal and weird if he's interested in the Latin mass. Or, you know, tongue-based uh, <laughs> communion. <laughs> Gives new meaning to the phrase, use the tongue. Uh, Yeah, I think that there's like there's a desire for I, I guess that was my uh, what I was getting at I didn't really express it well is that it, it's like they just want some excuse that the, the desire is already there it's late that I think it's because they're not beneficiaries of the system I mean this kind of gets back to the whole itself thing I told you to bring back to that but it's like it's like of course you're going to want to see the collapse of the system in, within which you're a loser I mean if you don't you know you live in a system that um, incentivizes um, you know what well, not it doesn't really incentivize but I mean but like sort of like hooky hookup culture for example which I think is way overblown. Look, if you're losing at life, it might have something to do with you. It, it might not be the system. So I know most people would rather just like point their fingers at the system and talk about how hopeless it is to you know, be an aristocrat, to be a worthy person in this uh, modern degenerate age. But uh, if you're losing at life, it might be a really good idea to see how much of this is on you. Well, um, but this concern about it, but uh, yeah. before it's just more streamlined. Um, but the, you know, if, if you're not in on that, if you're not getting any, um, you know, of course you're going to be like, well, we need to go back to, to this, uh, you know, a traditional, you know, family life, which I'm not against, obviously. I, I think it's good for people to get married and have children, especially yes. respect people. But it's like, but I'm not obsessed. Like, I, I was just able to do it. Uh, not because I'm some particular winner, but just be like, I don't know. It's like, um, that normal people, they're, they'll just eventually do that. But it wasn't because I actively was making some kind of countercultural lifestyle choice. Um, right. It's just, I just got old enough and was like, oh, yeah, I should do that. So, um but uh, and similarly, it's you know I, I think like this the rage against uh, what it is that, that you see on the tube. It's like you know if you were a reasonably um, like like if, if you were a grounded person, if you had a, a reasonable perspective of the world, you'd realize that this is just one element of culture, you know, and that it's and that it's sort of inherently low brow. Like it's a it's a commercial that's playing during a football game. Like this is you know it's it, it is what it is. Um, but there's there's some there's yeah. Richard seems to have attracted. A pretty significant audience of people who, like him, have graduated from 
alt-right extremism into something more pro-social. There's some desire there for, you know, to, to have a reason to revolt against civilization. Not even just the current paradigm, but like against its, all of its products and, and against uh, the, the, the sort of basis of having a liberal society in general. I mean, I mean liberal in the most antiquated sense. So I guess I, I wanted to know what, what you think, like what, what drives that? Like we've talked about all the symptoms of it, but like why is that? Don't you think it, if you're going to find some like primary cause, it is sexual? You know, like that's the most getting. No, I don't think uh, sexual is necessarily the, the primary cause, the most primal cause. I think the desire for meaning, desire for connection, of which sex is just one aspect, right? What, what people most need is the desire to feel connected to other people and to create a life of meaning and purpose that's going to derive from forming connections. If you just kick a ball back and forth, right, that's going to help form a connection with someone. If you just play basketball with someone, you play chess with someone, if you pray with someone, go to synagogue with someone, and that's going to form a connection. Out of that connection, you're going to get emotional energy. So Barcelona Football Club, they pass the ball an incredible amount, and with every pass, you get a little bit of emotional energy. So generally speaking, team that completes the most passes, generally speaking, wins the soccer game. So completing passes builds relationships, solidifies relationships, gives you emotional energy, and uh, gives you connection. And then out of that sense of connection, right, you are stronger. You now have purpose in life. And people really need purpose and meaning in life. And connection is the primary and healthiest form of meaning and purpose. Let's see, I mean, like, what's more motivating than that? And sexual frustration probably is at the heart of this. Could it have happened to Kanye? Kim? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I think I mentioned this in some of my interviews. Like, you know, I, I kind of resented this, uh, these, like, annoying liberals being like the uh, league of very divorced gentlemen or something <laughs> i mean look, these are kind of funny obviously i resent them being a divorced dad myself so you know but you know look, i can take a little ribbing here and there but you know i, I almost i almost find like his divorcedness as, as authentic you know whether i agree with him or not he, he is speaking to a certain anxiety about this and he, he clearly is yeah and someone who's divorced well at least they've made a go of marriage Right, they're probably more mature than someone like me who's never married at all. He's like still in love with Kim. Or So it's you know, he's been he's been wounded by that. But that, that's that's actually real, you know? It's kind of like the re the realest part of, about him. Yeah, there's some I don't know if this is too much of a stretch, but there's like some Arthurian overtones. Ah, it's a, a, a prominent figure, uh, wife goes off and does a scandalous thing. There's some forgiveness involved, but Christianity and mysticism like just kind of clouds the whole situation. Yeah, I don't know. he was profoundly. I, I remember hearing vague things about this. I wasn't really paying attention, but he was just obsessed with Pete Davidson as this like. And Pete Davidson is a total shithead. There's no other way of describing him. And just this like, you have this total shithead screwing your ex-wife. You know, like again, I look speaking personally, my ex-wife was just such a. Oh my god, I don't even want to go into it. I, I, I am beyond jealousy, actually. I would not, I would only be concerned if she gets with some horrible person who might harm my children. But if she had a boyfriend, I would be like, go free. Finally, you'll be less annoying. <laughs> no jealousy whatsoever. So Richard Spencer's own behavior and choices, you know, probably had something to do with how annoying uh, his ex-wife became. Right? It didn't just happen out of the blue. Uh, but I understand other men who have a lot of jealousy. Like, I totally get it. It's maybe kind of like not good, but it's understandable and you should have sympathy for them. Uh, but yeah, so I kind of understand like the Lancelot in the situation is Pete Davidson, which is pretty hilarious. Um, you know, Lancelot, oh, that's quite a name. Um, he was a kind of beautiful phallic image who, you know, has this affair with Guinevere. Um, so his Guinevere, the, the, you know, the, there's this uh, grotesque version of Lancelot, but he's kind of lost it. And um, yeah, I, I think there is an Arthurian quality to this. Yeah, who, who's, who's the Merlin in this situation? Is it Milo or? Yeah, it's like Ali Al Akbar, Nick Fuentes, or something. It's like the Merlin. If they're like the mentor figures. Weird. Wow. What about Georgia today? Uh, are you in for uh, two Negroes we got running from Georgia? <laughs> well, I, I probably. Yeah, 
G'day mate, 40 here in Manly listening to Alex Kashuta in Romania interview Steve Saylor about how has California changed him well fish don't know how swimming in the water has changed them so if you've lived in California almost all your life like Steve Saylor you're not going to be very good at articulating how California has changed you but uh, training ship going up and down the coast of California and he came back he wrote a bestseller called Two Years Before the Past and one of the things he told the American audience was California wow it's like the best place and practically nobody lives there uh, he especially emphasized the San Francisco Bay Area as barely uh, interest of the Mexican government So, over the centuries, the populations have grown dramatically, and not surprisingly, it's gotten really expensive. So, you know, in a lot of ways, it's it's a higher class place, and I was growing up in kind of, you know, beach boys, uh, childhood. Uh, it's also gotten fewer eccentrics, probably, uh, today than, you know, today it's kind of Florida. So you can still cre usually create a pretty good life for yourself in California, but definitely it's become much more expensive, there's much more crime, uh, the state is run by the left. Yeah, it's, um, I, I wonder because, you know, it's, uh, California is seen as a just extremely left-wing place. Have you ever been uh, a left-winger? Have you ever considered yourself a, a man of the left? Uh, me? thinking maybe for a couple of weeks when I was about 12. <laughs> In general, I've always been some kind of conservative uh, by temperament. Uh, you know, my, my father was uh, an aircraft engineer in Lockheed, so it was natural to, you know, my environment. To... And uh, Sea Sail is adopted, so many of our political orientations and uh, cultural and religious orientations uh, have a substantial, or well, not so much religious, but cultural and political orientations have a substantial genetic component. So let's see if I can find my way here. Dance between the waves. Uh, get back up. Get me to higher ground. Oh, okay, I'm stuck. Oh, shit. <laughs> oh. That wave got me. Here we go. Ouch. Here we go. Whew. It's not easy going where no man has gone before. So I had like a two, three year flirtation with Marxism when I was at college and university because uh, you know, I had some very eloquent professors and it sounded, and it sounded interesting and so I really got into it two or three years but aside from that I pretty much always had a fairly right wing uh, predisposition you know, recognizing that hierarchy is natural, that uh, traditional ways of doing things usually uh, a more uh, trustworthy than innovative ways of doing things, organizing community and families. Somebody was 
mentioning, uh, yeah, that basically, you know, I'm, I'm not part of the younger generation that's interested in, in European political philosophers. You know, I, I grew up as kind of an Anglophile, Adam Smith. Yeah, I think I, I grew up kind of as an Anglophile too. I haven't had a huge interest in the European philosophers, maybe just a moderate one uh, for people like uh, uh, Carl Schmitt. But probably Adam Smith has had a, a more profound effect on me. Johnson and so forth as, as a teenager. And uh, whereas, uh, you know, the, the kind of continental names like Carl Schmidt and so forth, before my time, and uh, so I can't, I can't, you know, I'm not that up on recent ideologies, uh, and I'm not even that ideological, and, you know, more empirical. As, as I've gotten older and, and time to create my Excel spreadsheets and data, uh, that that takes up most of my interest. So I noticed when I started studying economics seriously and calculus and the kind of higher mathematics that uh, I largely lost my appreciation for poetry and, and literature. So C. Saylor did an MBA, found he had a natural inclination towards statistics. And uh, when you find you're good at something and you start doing it a lot, you start doing it for a living, that shapes you. And so I think his MBA in business analysis has substantially shaped who he is today. Maybe some more uh, eccentric conclusions. So I think that's, you know, that's why people, I don't think people mind that you're not into Paul Schmidt or whatever esoteric politics, uh, because I feel like you're, you're obviously, you know, one of us in some way, even, even for the theory people, because you come to similar conclusions just by, yeah, interpreting. Yeah, I mean, my approach is, is sort of to think that there's a general continuum rather than a sharp dichotomy at different intellectual levels, that uh, if, if you're doing something that makes sense, um, if at the say at the social science level, it's also going to make sense in terms of uh, your real estate decision making. That if you, you know, if you say, oh, okay, yeah, that's a good neighborhood, good schools, things like that, yeah, it's going to show up exactly in the social science data. And if you're going to take it to higher intellectual levels. Yeah, they all want to fit. So Steve's not the exciting thinker that uh, Richard Spencer is, generally speaking. He's you know, much more grounded, he's much more realistic, uh, he's much more practical. So you know, normally listening to this would you know, find, yeah, 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 that, that makes sense. You might even find it, find it boring. Fit together and, and not contradict each other. A lot of people in the kind of conventional wisdom these days assume that there's some extreme contradiction and dichotomy between following the science and stereotypes, what people notice when they're lying up. So, yeah, Steve doesn't say anything particularly new or surprising in this whole interview. I, I didn't, you know, I wasn't surprised by one thing that he said. Just that uh, Steve is so consistently right. I think that's what makes him so impressive. So consistently right, and so consistently important, and uh, cons consistently level-headed. I don't think so. Uh, yeah. I mean, for example, I've been, I've been a social science aficionado since maybe I was 13 in 1972. And I just like reading, uh, you know, some academic papers that churn through a lot of data. Uh, most people assume that they, that they have to come to you know, highly leftist con conclusions, but it sure doesn't look like that to me when I, when I read them carefully and critically. It sure looks like, oh yeah, that's con 
connected to what people say about local crime rates or schools or whatever, um, that there isn't this sharp contradiction. Um, so uh, that's, um, I think, I think that's you know something I try to bring is is tied together the anecdotal, the social scientific. So it'd be funny if I get stuck in a higher tide here and uh, have to end up swimming for it and you know, trying to hold two thousand dollars worth of electronic equipment, you know, above the water. stuck down here. I'm going to have to swim for it. Okay, so I severely doubt that your uncle just came to the uh, same conclusions as Carl Schmidt. Right? I don't think that's going to happen. All right. Ready to make a jump for it? Oh, shit. Wow, this is slick. <laughs> My shoes are slick. Let's see where we end up here. All right, so you can't just into it, uh, Carl Schmidt. I, I, I don't really think that uh, people's uncles are going to come to the same conclusion as Carl. Or John Locke. Or Rousseau. Or Gramsci. Okay. How far? Uh oh, it looks like we've reached the end of the line here, folks. It's time to turn around, climb back up. What can I do here? Okay, maybe I have to run along here if I don't mind getting wet. So, maybe if I time it right. Maybe the prudent thing would be to just turn around. Uh, 
got to know when to hold them, know when to fold them, know when to walk away, and know when to run. Boy, I really did not bring the right climbing shoes. Ha ha ha. Here we go. Here we go. Whoa. Oh. Ah. Okay, we're still recording even though we got splashed. Got a sink shoulder here on higher ground. Man on the run. Not willing to just do the same boring walk I've done before. Not going to allow a little high tide to intimidate me. Huh. Probably climb up there would be easiest. I can keep going around. Let's see if I can keep going around here. Have to put Steve Saylor away here. Just uh, concentrate on finding my way. Man, you listen to a little Steve Saylor and kind of lose your bearings. You get so wrapped up. So, is there a way out? Gosh, this is a nice walk. This is the last walk I ever take. How can I complain? Is this the end of the road?
Here we go. Should be a lighthouse around here somewhere. I guide my way home. G'day, Maeve 40 here. So I managed to find my way back to civilization. Nice volunteer. Showed me the path, but what the hell is those? Oh, those are water dragons. There are so many bloody things that will kill you in the Australian bush. Oh, man. So uh, time to listen to a little more Steve Saylor. Those, you know, things that are just derived from noticing. You know, just Talking go down the street. Alex Kishuta. Yeah, so it's a... yeah, I'm, I'm basically a not uh, caught up with or, uh, you know, the, the, the higher level European ideological thinking. But yeah, it's, it's sort of like, oh yeah, your uncle and Charles Murray kind of came to the same conclusions from, from vastly different starting points. And uh, yeah, that's, that should be, you know, that suggests that the two of them are onto something. That uh, there isn't, uh, that there shouldn't be a contradiction. If if you assume for status reasons that um, that the science should disagree with your lying eyes, you're probably kidding yourself. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's uh, that was a very uh, useful tool for me to, to bring to my life in, in the Western world. I, I lived in, in Western Europe for a long time, studied there. Um, just being from Eastern Europe, where things are much more, uh, they work a bit more in a, in a straight line, especially after communism, when you know it, the liberalization of noticing really went hard. We People were allowed to notice, and we noticed everything. Um, and uh, we also looked up to the West quite a lot. So when I moved to, to the UK, to London, I was expecting the West. And what I saw was quite different. It was, uh, it was kind of, you know, a, a, a you know, spe speedy ticket to the third world. And it was really shocking to see how there, were no, there was no um, immune system against it. People were just laying down and taking it. It was incredible. We've especially seen that in the U.S. in this decade. Uh, you know, the, the, the George Floyd mania was so obviously a disaster while it was happening, but, you know, the, prestigi the prestige class couldn't resist themselves. Their logic led them to ridiculous conclusions, which have, have not been good for the country. And, uh, you know, if you're not going to tell the truth, uh, eventually it's going to turn around and bite you. you need, but, but the issue is that if you don't, what, what goes unsayable kind of becomes unthinkable and even inconceivable. And uh, so we've seen that, you know, with the big increase in crime and so forth since racial reckonings declared I don't know, 28 months ago or so and um, you know the people, the establishment just couldn't see it coming even though it had happened before and it happened in the 60s the huge increase in crime and really wrecked a lot of the, the great American cities in the 60s and you know we saw it on Mitten scale with the Ferguson effect after, when, in the first Black Lives Matter era in the mid 2010s, and then it just came back huge. You know, people get. Yeah. Do you think it's just 
So yeah, that which is prestigious is often wrong. That which is populist is often wrong. There's no shortcut to truth. And that which is compelling is often wrong. That which is authentic from the heart is often wrong. And there's no such shortcut to truth. But there are some very reliable tools that have replicated themselves dozens and dozens of times. And uh, the most valuable of all social science tools is the IQ test from Charles Murray. He synthesized the science in the bell curve. Kind of fear-based as well. Like uh, they, they fear what would happen if the, you know, the truth that you feel in uh, about differences in cognitive capacity, differences in crime, you know, uh, rates, uh, where. Uh, so in every society, right, there have been basic truths that you can say out loud. Right, so I don't think that we're unusual in that respect. Right, it's always taken courage to say basic unpopular truths out loud, and one should not necessarily do that. It's not necessarily to your advantage or to other people's advantage, but somebody should be saying basic truths out loud about elementary matters such as IQ and crime and the connection they're in. Uh, we're common knowledge. I mean, what, what would America look like? What would the world look like if that was, you know, just common knowledge? People would act according. My, my, my friend, uh, physicist uh, Gregory Cochran, asks, says, asks, well, how would the world look different? So apparently my, my journey around the cliffs, a lot of people do it and they get stuck and they have to try to make a swim for it and then it gets rough and they get sucked in and uh, there have to be rescues and helicopters so pretty foolhardy track that I just made around the, the cliffs but it was so fun it was so beautiful it's definitely something you want to do at low tide but as I was making the trek, the tide started coming in. I had to surrender to getting wet feet and uh, racing the high tide back to civilization. And then luckily found a volunteer, showed me the one trail up the mountain. And now I've got to get through, what, 40 beach here before the high tide starts. I think we'll be right, mate. No worries. If I was right, and his view is no, it's basically the world couldn't look any different because I'm trying to make up my ideas based on what it currently actually exists. Um, now, the question then becomes, would the world suddenly be hor a horrible place if everybody went, oh yeah, actually, um, you know, the bell curve is a sensible uh, look at how the world works as it was 28 years ago and things haven't changed a whole lot since then. I mean, it's... I mean, I joke that... All right, about 15 years ago there was a kid's movie series called National Treasure with Nicolas Cage running around kind of doing Dan Brown type stuff involving the American Founding Fathers. And the second one book of secrets he discovers that when you get elected president you get the key to open up the president's book of secrets that has you know the secret of the kennedy assassination area 51 and all the conspiracy theories are revealed in the president's book of secrets so i'm kind of wondering if like when you become the president of harvard university do does the previous president give you the Harvard president's book of secrets, which turns out to be a dog-eared copy signed by Richard J. Hernstein of the bell curve, and in it is, okay, this is why we have to have affirmative action focus at Harvard. You know, we're not going to get to a lot of black or, to a lesser extent, Hispanic representation that we think we really need any other way and you just can't get there without putting a thumb on the scale and 